Church family, it's okay to clap for that. That was incredible. Uh, church family, good morning. Church family, good morning. All right. My name is Rocky Shack. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am so glad to be able to have the opportunity to speak to you this Sunday. Last Sunday, you would not have wanted me in this room, okay? I'll tell you why. I lost my voice. We had the, this men's retreat. I lost my voice on that Saturday morning. Had to figure out how to preach through another sermon, all this other stuff. But last Sunday, I was in the bridge sounding like Kermit the Frog. So y'all didn't need me in here, okay? Um, I, I really am glad about this Sunday. I'm glad about this story from the Bible that I get to give to you uh, today. It's a story that happens between Jesus and one of his disciples, Peter. Here's the thing about Peter, okay? Peter is kind of the spokesperson of the disciples. These, these 12 disciples, he's kind of the spokesperson. He's the person that does everything first, okay? Everybody else might be thinking this, but Peter is going to be the one that's actually going to say what he's thinking, okay? Here's what I mean by that. There's a story here where Peter is asking Jesus about forgiveness. Jesus in the story is, is talking to his disciples about forgiveness. And even if you listen to that Lord's Prayer that Eddie just led us through, isn't there a line in there that talks about forgiveness? We teach our babies how to pray this prayer. But how hard that line is when it says, forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive others who trespass against me. How hard it is to be able to do that line there. And the disciples thought it was hard too. Because when Jesus teaches them how to pray and adds in that line, they're stunned. They can't believe that Jesus just made that command. That forgiveness from God and forgiveness for others would be connected. They're shocked by it. Here's why I love Peter. Because he's always the first. Can you think of the stories that you've heard Peter just be the first? You know, he's kind of Mr. Grand Opening, Grand Closing. So if you look at Peter, he's the first to get out of the boat. He's the first to walk on water, at least take a few steps. And then what happens? He sinks. Do you remember when Jesus tells his disciples that one of you will be the one that betrays me? He's the first to say something, right? He needs to make sure that everybody in the room knows that these, under, these other ungrateful disciples, they will betray you, but not me, Jesus. And then he denies Jesus three times. Uh, he's kind of the example to follow, and he's kind of the warning all at the exact same time. He's the model that we need to be following, but then at the same time, he's the cautionary tale of what it looks like when we are little of faith. And right now, I think Peter is having one of those moments where he is of little faith in this command that Jesus is given to his disciples. I think Peter is worried that Jesus' command will make it easier for people to get off the hook. I think he's worried that Jesus just gave people an out, that people can sin against us without any accountability. They don't have any consequences. Isn't it wild that we always think about that situation as someone sinning against us, but we don't ever think about how we want help away from those same consequences when it's us sinning against someone else? Peter is worried. He's worried about what this looks like, and the rest of the disciples are too. The difference is that Peter says something. This is what Peter does. Peter asks Jesus a question. He speaks up. This is the question he asks Jesus. He says, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And then in that same question, he adds a limit to it. Up to seven times? He's asking this of Jesus because he's saying to Jesus, I'm willing to allow up to seven, but no good person should need to be forgiven more than seven times. That's what he's really getting at. He puts a limit on Jesus. Church family, this is what we do sometimes. This is what we do when the way of Jesus becomes too radical for our liking. 
This is what we do when following Jesus gets a little too rich for our blood. We put a limit on God. We put a limit on Jesus. That's what Peter is doing here. Because it is too radical for me to forgive someone that keeps messing up in this relationship. It's too much for me to forgive someone that keeps making the same mistake. But what I love about Jesus is that Jesus uh, doesn't take kindly to uh, limits, right? He doesn't like when people put a limit on what he's trying to do in the world. Because we allow the world to tell us who Jesus is sometimes. When it should be the other way around. Jesus should be telling us how the world around us should be. Amen? So I want you to hear what Jesus says because Jesus gives this mic drop moment to Peter. And to the rest of his disciples because he knows their hearts, he knows what they're thinking. They're thinking the exact same thing Peter's thinking. He says to Peter, we must not forgive only seven times, Peter. We must not forgive only seven times, Rocky. We must not forgive only seven times, church. This is what Jesus says. We must forgive 70 times seven. I did the math on the calculator before I came in there. That's 490. It's 490 times. Now, here's the thing. There's other translations that say it's 77. But here's the point. It's not about whether it's 77 or whether it's 490. Because I believe there's somebody in this room that started to try to figure out. Let me see. Out of all the people I know, is there anybody that's coming up close to 490 that I've forgiven? It's not about the precise number. That's not what Jesus is getting after. This is what Jesus is after. The point in him saying this to Peter is if you are still counting, then you are still not forgiving. If you are still counting, you're still not forgiving. And Jesus brings his point even closer to them with a story, a parable. And we find this parable in Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 23. This is Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. Uh, When I say a parable, I'm talking about an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. Where God, where Jesus usually teaches, taking something that is very common, a very common situation, to explain a very uncommon forgiveness that is in God's kingdom. So I want you to hear this parable this morning. But if you're able-bodied, will you stand for the reading of the gospel? Hear the word of the Lord. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and his children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell to his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and he pleaded with him, have have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and he threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as you, as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother From your heart. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
Let's break this story down because it's a, it's a tough story. It's a tough story. It begins with a problem. Really, it's not just a problem. It's a crime, a wrongdoing, an offense. You have this king who has this servant who owes him a debt of 10,000 talents. Okay, let me help you make sense of 10,000 talents. Let me put it in today's terms. 10,000 talents. Usually what would happen, an average working man would have brought home a single talent per year. A single talent per year. So let's just say in today's terms, that's $40,000. $40,000 a year. Now multiply that times 10,000. $400 billion. Church family, say $400 billion. It's a lot of money, okay? I'm going to tell you how much money that is. That's more money than 80% of the countries today. $400 billion to one person. Why this crazy number? Why would Jesus bring this number up to us? Maybe Jesus wants you to understand this type of slave that he's dealing with, this servant that he's dealing with. What if I told you that this servant may have been a governor in the kingdom and this person mismanaged the entire kingdom and the economy of the kingdom and has literally made it to where the kingdom is suffering from $400 billion in debt? What if I told you maybe he gives you this number because he wanted you to have an an unimaginable debt, a number so high that you couldn't even imagine getting from under it? This person's dealing with $400 billion. So the king confronts the servant, and now he wants him to make good on the money. I want the $400 billion that you're in debt for, which no human being can come up with. No human being can be able to pull this off. Now, the way that they dealt with bankruptcy then, they sold you into slavery. They sold your family into slavery and sold everything that you had and kept you there until you could be able to pay off the debt that you have. So the king calls for the sale of this person and his family. But then there's a request. This person drops to their knees, begs and begs the king, please don't do this. His words exactly, have patience with me, I will pay back everything. I will pay back everything. Real sorrow for his wrongdoing. He's sorrowful about the crime. He's not just having regret here, but he's, he's trying his best to make amends. He's trying to heal this relationship with this king who has trusted him. But it's also $400 billion. That's a bunch of money. I don't care how sincere your effort is. How are you paying back $400 billion? It's impossible. You can never replace that money. But then the king does something that makes no sense. The king does something that by by this world's standards, they have never seen happen before. How much money did I say that was again? He released him of $400 billion. He released him of the debt. He forgave him of the debt, freeing him from the burden that he's put on his own shoulders. The king has patience. He has patience. What is patience? Patience is the ability to bear the suffering and not give in to it. Patience is the ability to bear the burden, the the suffering of someone and not give into it. So to forgive someone of their debt is to absorb the price, to take on the cost yourself. And that's what this king does, because the price of wrongdoing does not evaporate and just go into the air. It's very real. There was a real hurt that was there. There was a real pain that was experienced. You can't just take that away. But instead, what the king does, he moves the cost of the wrongdoing from the servant to the king. From the servant to the king, and the king is willing to bear it. The servant is free. And, be, and he has this newfound freedom. He's so excited about being free. Do you know what he did next? He went 
and he found somebody that actually owed him some money. He just got set free from how much money? $400 billion. But then here this man is over here with 100 denarii. And now he wants him to come up with the money. And when this man does not have the money, he threatens to throw him in jail. And when the man falls to his knees and he says a line that's very familiar, right? He says something that we just heard. Have patience with me. I will pay you back. It's the same thing that the first servant said, and he was forgiven. But now you have the second servant, and he chokes this man and throws this man into jail. Throws him into jail because he cannot pay. Now, luckily, word gets back to the king. And when the king finds out what just happened, he's angry. He can't believe it. Bring this servant to me. He brings this servant, and this servant is so unforgiving. How? He's trying to figure out how could you be so unforgiving. I gave you the world. I forgave you of everything. I forgave you of $400 billion. And you couldn't let this man be over 100 denarii. He's so angry that he says, you're going to jail. You're going to jail because what should have transformed you and what should have allowed you to forgive someone the way that I forgave you, you missed it. And now he goes into jail. And then Jesus says this line at the very end, and it's a chilling line. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, it's one of those scriptures, I think we all have scriptures that we read in the Bible sometimes that absolutely frighten us. This is the scripture that absolutely frightens me. I bet you it frightened Peter and the disciples. And this is what Jesus says to him. He says this warning, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It's tough stuff, right? It's a tough story, but it's a story that we need. And the meaning is not hard to understand. Who is the king in the story, church? You can talk to me. Who's the king in the story? God. It felt like that was a child that said that. I love that if it was a child. But it's God. And who are the servants? All of us. All of us are the servants. 10,000 talents, $400 billion, an infinite and measurable debt that we all owe God. That we all owe God. God created us, sustained us every single moment of our life. And then here we are. And sometimes the very forgiveness that we want from God, that we ask for from God, we sometimes come up infinitely short on giving that same forgiveness to someone else. What does this parable mean for you and me? What is Jesus really trying to tell us about forgiveness that we've received from God, but also the forgiveness that we should be giving to the people around us? What is God after? What is Jesus getting at? Here's the first thing. Our debt to God is too large for us to make up. It's too large for us to make up. $400 billion. It's immeasurable. It's too big of a debt. You can't make that up. You can't pay that back. And I think that's why Jesus used that number. You couldn't even see an end to it if you wanted to. Paying it back is unrealistic. Just like trying to pay God back is unrealistic. But we keep fixing our mouths to say that we are earning our way to heaven with our good deeds. We can't. We can't earn it. It is something that can only be freely given by the person that we are in debt to. And that is exactly what this king does. This king does this, and it's the same thing that God does in his kingdom. He has given us a way not to have to pay him back. Where all we have is just gratitude. Live out of celebration for what has happened. But sometimes we do like to serve it. And instead of the first thing that we do, go and celebrate. We turn to somebody else that owes us something. We turn to somebody else that has wronged us. 
and we don't give that same forgiveness that we just got. We don't give that. We can't pay God back. Sometimes I'm going to tell you what we say. I'm, at least I'm going to tell you what I've said in the past. In the past I've said, God, if you'll just forgive me, I'll go to church every week. God, if you just forgive me, I'll try harder to be good, or at least I'll try harder to appear good. That is just as bad as us trying to say, if you forgive me, I will pay back $400 billion by paying $5 a month. It doesn't work. Church, we cannot earn our way to heaven. We can't earn our way to heaven through our good works. Because if it was all about good works, man, we could have saved ourselves from this junk. But we couldn't. That's why the king has to give it freely. The king has to do that. We can't undo the damage that we've done. But the king, the king can say whether we're guilty or not. This king said he was not guilty. You're not guilty anymore. And that's the same thing that God does for us. The second thing is this. We are forgiven so that we can forgive. We are forgiven so that we can forgive. We, are, we were forgiven with a purpose, church. There's something that Eddie says all the time in our staff meetings, and I love it. Because now I say it in, I say it in meetings with other people. He always brings up the so that. So that. We're doing this church event so that something can happen. We're doing X so that blank can happen. The king forgives the servant so that that king can then go and forgive somebody else. We're forgiven with a purpose. This man and this king needed that relationship restored. And the king is the only one that can be able to do something about it. So the king is the one that forgives. And when he forgives and he heals that relationship, that person goes from being slave to a citizen again. That person is a part of this city again. This person can be family member again. And all this servant does is fall to his knees and he truthfully tells what he has done wrong. This is how I messed up. This is the place where I've sinned against you. And he doesn't make any excuse for it. He truthfully tells what he's done wrong. And then the king forgives him. The king forgives him. And when the king forgives him, he takes on and absorbs that $400 billion debt, and he takes that on himself. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if I would have done that. I'm also going to be honest with you. I don't know what it's like having $400 billion. But I will tell you this. I bet you it hurt. I bet you it hurt taking that on. But the king was willing to do it. The king was willing to do something that was tough and that hurt even though somebody had hurt him. That's the same thing that God does for us. The exact same thing. Listen to this. When we repent of our sin, what is it? It's us telling the truth of how we've wronged God or how we've wronged somebody else. It's us telling the truth. And when we tell the truth, guess what God does? God makes a way for that relationship to be healed. He makes a way for that relationship to be restored between us and God. But the way God does that, he has to take on the debt. Because what did I say? The price of that wrong, it does not just disappear. It doesn't just evaporate into thin air. Instead, God takes it on. That's what reconciliation looks like, church. That's what reconciliation looks like. It looks like us being changed and being willing to do the same for somebody else. I love how Jesus tells this story. He talks about this servant who should have been celebrating, but instead he, fail, he fails big time. He goes out and finds somebody that owes him money. He flunks the test. He refuses to forgive the smallest of amounts. And this, this king is beside himself. He cannot believe this type of mercy. I have lavished you with this type of mercy, this great of mercy. And you couldn't even give a little mercy to somebody else. He throws them in prison. 
throws him in prison for that. In a lot of ways, I feel like this story is an arrow pointed towards our hearts, man. It's us, it's, it's Jesus having to tell us a story and reminding us of this great mercy that we've all received. Because if you remember how much you've been forgiven, then you just might want to go out and forgive somebody else too. Because the third thing that we learned from this story is that our king was willing to be a servant. Our king was willing to be a servant. The one that holds the keys to all this thing decided to be a servant. Do you notice in this story how this servant tried to be a king? This servant who just received all this grace goes out and now wants to try to be a judge for somebody else. How often do we do that, church, where we sit in the wrong seat? God has set us free. God has forgiven us. And in our freedom, we go and we sit on the chair that God deserves. Tries to be a judge for somebody else. But the one who has the right to judge is the same one who came down from heaven. Is the same one who got in a criminal spot, a spot that that we deserved. And was just like what the song that we just sang. Spotless was this lamb. No debt did Jesus know. But yet he took on all the debt. He took on all the spots. He took on the blemishes. For your sake and mine. For your sake and mine. So that we might be able to be righteous. So that we might have an opportunity to do some king level stuff like forgiving people who have wronged us, like living into that prayer that we pray and we teach our babies to pray. Forgive me of my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against us. Church family, I want to wrap up with a story. I want to tell you about a tragedy in the church. This was on June 17, 2015. On that day, Dylan Roof, a white supremacist, walked into the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. He shot and killed nine African American members who were gathering for Bible study. Matter of fact, they had actually invited Dylan to come in and be a part of this Bible study. Dylan was unrepentant in the weeks and the months afterwards, and he wrote in his journal in prison. He wrote, I want to make sure it is crystal clear. I do not regret what I did. At almost every step along the way, the people of Emmanuel AME Church had words of forgiveness for Dylan. Every chance they got, even at the bond hearing, the families and the family members of victims spoke forgiveness for him. But not everyone connected with the shooting found forgiveness is easy. There's also Reverend Sharon Fisher, Risher. She was and is a pastor. And on that day, she lost her mom. She lost her two cousins. She lost a friend in that shooting. All of them gone. She knew she, she was a pastor, so she was called to forgive. But for her, the words wouldn't come out of her mouth. She said, forgiveness, my journey of moving towards total forgiveness has been long, it has been hard, it has been lonely, and it's been complicated. Two years after the shooting, long after Dylan was sentenced to death, Reverend Risher was preaching a sermon, and it was in that moment that she let go. This is what she said. She said, I said out loud that I forgave him. I forgave him for what he did. I heard myself say from the depths of my soul those words of realization. It didn't come as a big epiphany that it settled in my soul. God was telling me I was strong, that I am faithful, and that it was time. For Reverend Risher, forgiveness for her tormentor came not because it was easy, Not because it was natural, not because others were telling her that she had to forgive, but it came out of her her relationship with Jesus. 
That's how her forgiveness grew. That's how it grew. And she offered the unnatural, the unexpected gift that freed her and allowed her to experience God's blessings. She could not control evil in this world. Church family, we cannot control evil in this world. We can't. But what we can control is how we respond to it. How we respond to it. I feel like sometimes we go into this thing saying to ourselves that I have to forgive. Because I'm a Christian, I have to forgive. But that was not the case for her. It was a two-year journey where Jesus was taking her from unforgiving to forgiving. But sometimes it only just takes a few steps. It just takes someone willing to get started on the path towards it. Because in that moment, two years later, she realized, I don't have to forgive. I get to forgive. I get to forgive because there's one who has forgiven me of all of my 400 billion. I was forgiven so that I could forgive somebody else. And if I don't forgive, the world is watching. How will the world know that Jesus forgives sins if I can't even forgive one person? So church family, I'm going to leave you with this question. Because Christ slowly and faithfully shaped her. Will we be shaped by the world or will we be shaped by Jesus? Will we be shaped by a world that is overly punitive and vindictive? Or will we be shaped by the one who has forgiven us and is looking for us to forgive too? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this tough story. This tough sermon that I even needed to hear before anybody else. Lord, I pray for my church family. Because I would imagine that each one of them have a face that came up while we talked about forgiveness. Had a name that came up as we talked about forgiving. Lord, just keep your truth in front of us. That we are people who have been forgiven we have been forgiven by the king so that we can go out and be image bearers of that king. Help us to go out and freely give forgiveness because you've freely given it to us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.